was the night before Christmas, and deep in the house, a creature was stirring, ready to pounce. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, whilst phantom footsteps ascended the stair. The children were nestled, all snug in their beds, but a dark shadow figure loomed over their heads. And Mama in her kerchief, and I in my cap, were about to be woken by one ghostly rap. Welcome, glad tidings, peace on earth and mince pies for all. I'm Lil. And I'm Fitz. And you're listening to a very festive edition of Knock Once for Yes. It's that time of year again, and we've dusted off the stockings and got the Yule log ablazing, all ready for you to settle in for that favourite of Christmas pastimes, sharing a few ghost stories around the fireside. We also have a seasonal offering on the Paranormal Radar, and of course, we have our slightly dodgy Christmas quiz. And what could be more Christmassy than poltergeists? Indeed. <laughs> but before we get stuck into all of that, we want to say a big thank you to our latest patron, Trevor Chapman. And a huge thank you to Elizabeth Rose for her donation via coffee. And now, Fit, what tasty seasonal side dish have you got for me on this episode's Paranormal Radar? I have a Christmas-related Paranormal Radar story for you this time, and it comes from My London News. It tells of a ghost seen at Ickenham Tube Station every Christmas time since the 1950s. It's said to be the ghost of a woman who fell onto the tracks and was electrocuted. Ooh, festive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she wears a bright red festive scarf. Okay, I'll give you that. Uh, stands at the end of the platform, waving frantically at any other people on the platform before vanishing. It is a bit of a threadbare tale, I'm afraid, if an interesting one, and the fact that it's apparently been seen every year since the 1950s would imply that it's a good candidate for an investigation. I wonder if anyone would mind if we camped out there for a month. Considering that she's supposedly so often seen, I struggled to find much in addition to the article from My London News. That's not to say that it was difficult to find in other sources, but they all pretty much say the same thing, sometimes literally, so I presume that there's either little else to say, or that they all come from the same source. I did find another brief mention of a ghost at Ickenham Station from an underground station manager, and that referred to a ghost that was often seen at Ickenham after the last train had left. But there were no further details, so it may be referring to the same apparition, or there may be a second at the same station. There is, however, a very rich history of ghost sightings at many of London's underground stations, and if you get the chance, the documentary Ghosts of the Underground is worth a watch. I would love to investigate some of the haunted tube stations, because well, I think they're all meant to be haunted. There's so many ghosts down there, and that documentary, The Ghosts of the Underground, is... I've watched it about four times and it never gets old. But the other thing I really want to do is to see some of the closed, the ghost stations, are they called? The ones that aren't in service anymore? Yep. Yep. Mm. I would also love to. I did look up how much it costs and it was like four or five hundred pounds for the night to visit them. Um, I was just going to say, you can get in there, but it costs a lot. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, out of our price range at the moment, but it's definitely up there on the bucket list. Oh, definitely. I'd love to go and see some of those. Well, I think we'll have our first dodgy Christmas quiz question after we get into the stories a little bit. So without further ado, it is now story time. And for us adults, Christmas is all about family, friends, good food, and of course, ghost stories. But for kids, there is no denying that it is all about the toys. So to bring a festive chill to your fireside today, we have two listener stories about haunted toys. And this first one is from Kate. Many things have happened on and off in my life, but let's start with one I remember as clear as day, and one I know that Lil particularly will not enjoy. At this time, my family, Dad, Mum and me, lived in Hemel Hempstead. I was around nine or ten, and for the past four to five years, 
my great aunt on my dad's side had been giving me the same gift for both birthdays and Christmas. Little ceramic clown dolls. I thought they were really cute at the time and actually still do now. At this point of the story, I had nine in my collection, and although a lot of these types of dolls were bright and colourful, one of the clowns in my collection was not, and being monotone in colour, he stood out from the rest. He became my favourite, and soon earned a place of honour on my bedside table. Now, I'm a heavy sleeper. Normally nothing would wake me, not thunderstorms, nor earthquakes... But one night something did. A thud so loud it not only woke me but also my father, also a dead-to-disaster sleeper, who was concerned enough to come and check on me. In my room I had a small bookshelf which held three of my colourful clown dolls with another five on top of my wardrobe, and of course the monotone clown would be on my bedside table next to me as I slept. Except that tonight, Monotone wasn't there. Looking across the room, I could see that he was on top of the wardrobe with the colourful dolls, and the clown whose spot he'd taken was now on the floor. I sat there dumbfounded for a moment, then picked up the fallen clown. Dad asked if I wanted him to replace it. No, no, that, that's okay, I told him. Monotone can stay up there if he wants to. When we were preparing to move, I packed all my clowns carefully back in their individual boxes, then tucked all the clowns, with Monotone in the middle, snugly into a larger box, wrapped them all up in bubble wrap, and sealed the box. We arrived at our new house, and I began to unpack my belongings, unsealing the box with all of my treasured clown dolls. All of the boxes were there, including Monotone's, but Monotone himself was not. All of the boxes of my colourful clowns were sealed shut, but the cover to Monotone's box was torn open and the doll was gone. To this day, we don't know where he went. We even asked the people who bought our house in Hemel Hempstead to let us know if they ever found him, but we never heard from them. Thank you, Kate. I mean, yeah, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> clowns, dolls, haunted clown doll. I mean, at this point, I'm I'm sort of rocking in a corner. Now, I know this sounds like a creepy pasta, but I know the person that sent this story in, and it really, truly is an actual, real life story. And do you know what the worst part is, Fitz? Tell me. The town they moved to was here. the The town that we live in right now. So, depending on when Monotone went missing, that very well could mean that there is a creepy clown doll scampering around our hometown in the middle of the night. I think we're safe, and I think we're safe for one horrifying reason. Why? Well, if you remember the end of the story, we you know, we asked the people that bought our old house if they could let us know if they found him, and we never heard from them. I think you never heard from them because they were murdered brutally in the <laughs> night by a monochrome clown doll that you left behind. <laughs> See, I didn't read it like that. I read it like, oh, you know, we, we contacted the people, but, you know, they never found him. But you're right. It actually says we never heard from them, which is so sinister now I think about it. Oh, well, I'm pretty sure I've talked about this on the show before, but in case I haven't, or for those of you that don't know, although you might have figured it out by now, I'm pretty afraid of dolls, and I'm all out afraid of clowns. And basically the reason for this is because when I was a kid, my sister collected these very same kind of porcelain clown dolls. They never leapt off the shelf at me or anything, but the house we lived in at the time was mildly haunted, and if I ever woke in the night and needed the bathroom, I would have to run the gauntlet in the dark past her open bedroom door and see all these tiny, pale, glowing white clown faces peering out at me from the darkness. And it's pretty much haunted me ever since. I'm presuming they were quite similar to the one she bought us one year. Yes, at, well, but on a smaller scale. 
that thing one, was creepy. The one she bought us, as my sister bought us as a Christmas present one year, was like that, but scaled up to be even more terrifying because <laughs> it, it was, was bigger. the sort of thing that you could imagine holding a knife at the foot of the bed. Yeah, we didn't hang on to that for long. We had and to it, give it away. It was blindfolded when it came to us, wasn't it? I know, it? that's how it was wrapped. It was wrapped with like a bandage around its eyes, which I know there are a lot of um, sort of horror-themed dolls out there now, which would come in that kind of a format mm-hmm. and that would make sense. But this wasn't one of those dolls. It wasn't meant to be scary. That was why it was scary. It was very scary. <laughs> And I think the worst part of it was, I think it was meant to go on top of a Christmas tree. That was like the intended purpose. (laughs) Can you imagine? You wouldn't want that staring down at you. No. So thank you, Kate, I think. And we have another terrifying haunted toy story coming up. But I think it's time for the first of our Christmas quiz questions. Are you up first, Fitz? I certainly can be up first. I know previous years, some of our questions have been a little bit obscure, so I've done my best to be quite generic and not obvious, but certainly something that I'm pretty sure you're aware of. Yeah, I think over the last couple of years, we may have got a little bit carried away trying to outcompete each other and got more and more and more obscure. So I basically did the same thing this year. I tried to kind of bring it back a bit more into pop culture that we might actually know the answer to. So fair fair dues, go ahead. Yeah, mine are all location based because we are very much about visiting the locations. Oh, okay. So which location said to be the most haunted house in England had various reports of the paranormal, including phantom coaches and horsemen, a poltergeist, a headless man, and the ghost of a nun. Oh, phantom horses and a coach. I don't know. Well, I've got time to think about it while we get to our second story. But first, we wanted to share how we were thrilled to hear that we inspired one of our lovely listeners to start their own paranormal podcast. Caleb Shaddock has just released the first few episodes of his brand new podcast, The Paranormal Burrito. But before we tell you all about it, Caleb has a story to share with us today. Hi guys, um, my name is Caleb Shattuck and I wanted to tell you today about a uh, time slip story. It was probably 11 or 12. We were with my um, mom and my brother in the car and where we live, we live in northern Nevada. So we live in Carson City and about half an hour away, there's this town called Minden and there is a really nice pool in Minden. And so my mom would drive us probably about three times a week to go get swimming lessons up in the pool in Minden. Anyway, so as we're driving back between the two towns, there's a lot of really wide open farmland. And then there's a like four lane freeway between Minden and Carson City. Uh, So you're driving along and there's a fair amount of cars, but uh, it's not like any major city highway. It's a rural freeway that you drive through however you get you have enough cars so you notice cars passing you what had happened is we saw a brown truck and i know this seems um not pertinent but it will be we saw a brown truck a i believe it was like a red car and then like a uh handyman's truck it had like the big racks on the truck and it had the ladders and stuff and then I think there was like a plumber's van or something but anyway we were going and um everyone was in the left lane and my mom in her van at the time those cars passed us in that sequence and I remember it being significant because the brown truck had like a checkerboard type towel in the rear window and they had, because they were coming from the pool as well, from their swim lessons, it was um, another group of people taking swimming lessons. So they had put, I guess, the towel in the rear windows to let it dry. As those cars passed us, um, it was about 10 minutes later. So those cars had a lot of time to get way ahead. The same cars passed us again. And it was the brown truck and the worker truck and then the red car and the plumber van. They all passed us in the same sequence. 
there was no way that we could have slowed down and or sped up and got ahead of them and then they passed us again to this day my mom and my brother and me we swear it my dad doesn't believe it but that is um one of my creepy stories that i thought i'd share with you guys i hope you enjoy thanks bye and thank you to Caleb for sharing that story with us. Do you know what the first thing that sprang to mind was? What? Was Bardogas. Why is that? Well, you're seeing something before it happens. So I'm wondering if the first time round, oh. it was almost like a Vardoga. Do you know what? That actually makes sense. And it's not something that occurred to me. Because we don't get an awful lot of time slip stories, do we? No, when you get the time slip stories, they tend to be, you know, I saw something that hadn't been there for 50 years or yeah. Yeah, a long time but this is so close you could be right perhaps it's more it was more of a vardoga you know seeing it before it happened mm, that's what mm. sort of sprang to mind first I and mean, yeah it's an interesting one and you don't come across these very often and they really intrigue me mm. but like you say it's there's something that sticks in your mind Wait, didn't i just see that a minute ago like, and it's very, very specific very, very specific details that mm. caleb picked up that you just you wouldn't see that sequence again. It would just be so unlikely to see that exact same sequence of cars, especially it, it doesn't sound like the traffic was that heavy. No, and I'm wondering if the other the people in the other cars saw them twice as well. Oh, that's well, that's a bit too brain bending for today. <laughs> I, don't think my, I don't think my head can cope with that. <laughs> so thank you so much again for sharing that with us, Caleb. And we wish you the very best of luck with your brand new show. If you want to go and check out The Paranormal Burrito, you can do so on iTunes or any of your favourite podcast platform. But of course, we will put the link in the show notes. I will certainly be checking that out now. Lil, quiz question. (laughs) Can you just give me a brief recap of the question again? I can. Which location, said to be the most haunted house in England, had various reports of the paranormal, including phantom coaches and horsemen, a poltergeist, a headless man, and the ghost of a nun. See, it's the the phantom coach and horses and the headless man that's throw me, but the most haunted house in England and the nun, I'm going to take a guess at Borley Rectory. Congratulations. <gasps> yeah, I win. Well, not quite win. I win one. <laughs> well, you definitely stand a higher chance of winning than you did a moment ago. Yes, well done. <laughs> okay. Yours are going to be really hard now, aren't they? And I'm going to be terribly, (laughs) terribly bad at them. Uh, One of them you're definitely going to get. I'll be incredibly surprised if you don't, because to be honest, it's not even a real question. It's just something I kind of want to talk about with you. But my first question is not that one. So, which beloved children's book caused great excitement this year in the paranormal world? Ah, uh, you know I don't read children's books and didn't even when I was a child. So you got, may uh, have read this one. So think hard. I was reading Tom Clancy at like eight. There's no <laughs> chance I'll have read this. No, I th- I really genuinely, I, I do think you might have done. That's why I sort of, that's why I thought this one was okay. But oh, well, think on it, think on it. And um, let's have another story. Oh, and it's another creepy doll story. This one's from Verity. We lived in an old Victorian townhouse for a few years. It was mildly haunted. A young boy played on the stairs, and there was an older lady who walked around occasionally, but overall it wasn't your conventional haunting. We had some visitors from America one year, and that Christmas they sent us all presents. I can't remember what my brother and I were gifted, but I do remember what my sister had been given, a gorgeous doll who played hopscotch. It came with a little hopscotch mat, and as you moved the doll as if she was playing, She'd sing a little song. Hopscotch is my favourite game. That's why Hopscotch is my name. Sometimes one foot, sometimes two. And I'd like to hop with you. She had buttons on the bottom of her feet. So she would also say, use both feet after the first line if both feet weren't registered. And she would giggle. Both my sister and I loved it. For context, my sister was about seven and I was about 13. She played with hopscotch every day for months, to the point that we were all singing the hopscotch song in our sleep. That song was drilled into us. Then one day, 
my sister stopped playing with her. She never gave a reason, she just stopped. Hopscotch now lived on the far side of her bedroom, sitting on a pile of books. She'd been there a week or so before things got weird. My sister and I were in her bedroom on the other side of the room to hopscotch. I think it might have been around springtime, and all I remember was that it wasn't late. All of a sudden, we both heard, Use both feet! My sister and I looked at each other, looked at the doll, and laughed it off. Even at that age, we'd both heard of haunted dolls, but we found it to be a bit amusing rather than scary at this point. We shrugged it off and continued with our evening. At the time, my sister slept in one of the bedrooms on the top floor, and my bedroom was directly underneath hers. A couple of days passed. One morning, our mother asked if my sister had been playing with hopscotch during the night. She hadn't. My mother replied jokingly, You've got a molly dolly. I told you, we found it funny. Another few evenings passed, and my sister confessed that she'd thrown hopscotch under the bed. She had a cabin bed, so the only way to get under it was to pull the desk out and crawl under. I can't remember her reasoning for this action, but looking back on it, it was probably something that made sense to her. At least if hopscotch is under the bed and can't get out, well, there's nothing to worry about, right? All night, all my sister and I heard was creepy giggles, use both feet, and the first line of that song. The next day, our mother asked to check the doll, so my sister dutifully went under her bed to get her. She checked the on-off switch, she was turned off. My sister was getting creeped out now, and we were all getting annoyed with the hopscotch is my favourite game. There was always a lull between favourite and game. I'll admit, I was getting a little creeped out myself. Why didn't we just throw the thing out, put it in the bin? My sister, bless her, didn't want to anger or upset Hopscotch by discarding her. And she was a gift my sister hadn't had for a year yet, so she saw it as rude. So Hopscotch was put back under the bed. We all saw the switch in the off position. But still, when it was quiet, we'd hear, Use both feet! I wish I could tell you how this was resolved, I'm afraid I don't actually remember anymore. We eventually took the batteries out of the doll, but I don't remember if that helped. Part of me says yes. The other part of me swears I have a memory of us holding her, the battery pack open and empty, just as we heard. Use both feet! But we moved out of the house soon after that anyway, although not because of the doll. I'd like to think, though, that Hopscotch is still under that bed, singing away to herself. And thank you to Verity for sharing that story with us. I'm pretty sure Lil's not getting any sleep tonight. I'm pretty <laughs> sure I'm not getting any sleep tonight after that. Oh my word, that was horrific. Oh, but I have to add again, this is not a creepy creepypasta. This story has come from a friend of mine. It really happened and she is quite rightly still pretty freaked out by it all. She also has given us a recording of the Hopscotch song. She did say it was drilled into her memory. Now, unfortunately, Verity's recording had a little bit too much background noise in it for us to be able to clean it up. But against my better judgment, because I feel like you guys need to share these nightmares <laughs> with me, I have learnt the song, and so I will sing it for you now. Hopscotch is my favourite game That's why Hopscotch is my name Sometimes one foot, sometimes two and I'd like to hop with you. It's pretty terrifying with Lil doing it now. It was even more terrifying with Lil learning how to do it whilst <laughs> listening to a spooky, windy version that had been recorded <laughs> on a spooky, windy nighttime walk. <laughs> yeah, nightmares abound. <laughs> so thank you once again to Verity, we think, for sharing that experience with us and to all our lovely listeners. Good luck sleeping tonight. <laughs> yes, thank you again, Verity, for that nightmare of a story. And thank you to everybody that shared stories with us for today's episode. 
If you've got a paranormal story that you'd like to share, we would love to hear it. Please do get in touch at notonesvs.com to share it with us. And now, Fitz, back to the quiz. Do you have an answer for me? Do you want me to say the question again? Um, it was something to do with a children's book, which means I have no idea what it was. Oh, you will, you will. You're going to kick yourself. Which beloved children's book caused great excitement this year in the paranormal world? And I guarantee you will have seen this. Mm, Winnie the Pooh? <laughs> I've heard of Winnie the Pooh. It's the Usborne children's non-fiction title, World of the Unknown, all about ghosts. If you see a picture of it, you'll know what I'm talking about. Originally published in 1977, the book inspired a generation of future ghost hunters and paranormal enthusiasts. With its colour illustrations reminiscent of a comic and a magazine-sized format, it was instantly appealing to younger readers, and yet it covered a whole multitude of paranormal topics, from famous haunted houses to classic sightings such as the Black Shuck, to ghost hunting, and even debunking. It lit up the imaginations of thousands of young, curious minds. And Fitz, I can't believe you would never have got this out of the library. Because I did. Um, I remember it, and I have read it. I think I had it. Yeah, I recognise it. And I'm kicking myself now. <laughs> For some reason, when you said children's book, the first thing that came into my head was fiction. And I was like, no, I've got no chance at this. No, well, see, that was my little red herring that I kind of put in there for you. But no, it was non-fiction. It was aimed at, well, I suppose when I say children, it's young adults as well, really. Um, but it would just as equally appeal to, to adults sort of starting in the field, I think, to be honest, for its time, at least anyway. Because, you know, this was, well, when I read it, it was the 90s, possibly 80s. There wasn't an awful lot of sort of beginners mm -hmm. ghost hunting yeah, material out there. It was books very like that, thin yeah. on the ground. So anything like that that you could get your hands on, I I read, and I'm sure you would have done as well. But it was actually a really good book. It had a lot of information in there and just covered fields and topics, like I say, like ghost hunting and debunking that most books in the genre at the time they just didn't even touch on yeah i'm fairly sure it had like the screaming skulls in there mm -hmm. as well yeah, yeah i do remember it now yeah yeah, so uh, yeah, so yeah. You kick yourself Fair enough yep i am kicking myself <laughs> having been out of print since the 90s most of us had forgotten all about this library favorite until a petition was set up to prove to the publishers that there was a great interest in having the book back on our shelves and it quickly exceeded the target of 1000 signatures with so many people coming forward to say how much they had loved the book as a child and how much it had influenced them, Usborne quickly saw that there was true demand for the title and reprinted it just in time for Halloween 2019. Now, what I didn't realise about this book, and it's interesting that your first question was about Borley Rectory, was that this all came about because of a new film about Borley Rectory. Oh, really? <laughs> and if we were in Helia, we'd be going, synchronicity right now. <laughs> It was only in looking up the details for this quiz question that I heard about it. Apparently, also released for Halloween this year was an animated documentary style film. I'm not quite sure what that is. I was a bit confused, but stay with me. All about the famous Borley Rectory haunting, written and directed by Ashley Thorpe and starring Reese Shearsmith, both of whom had read this Usborne's World of the Unknown All About Ghosts book as a child, and they cited the book as their inspiration for the film. The director had first read about Borley Rectory haunting in this very book and tweeted, I would never have made my animated film Borley Rectory if I hadn't loved the book so much as a child. Wonderful books and ripe for a new generation to discover. So when the filmmakers got in touch with the publishers to ask for an interview about the books that had so inspired them, all parties began to realise just how loved and well remembered the books were and that's what got the ball rolling on the campaign to get them republished. And apparently that interview with the publishers did happen and is included on the film's Blu-ray release along with a whole host of other extras. So I think the DVD may be going on my next year's Christmas list. That sounds pretty interesting. Fair enough. I'm quite intrigued to find out what an animated documentary style film is. Yeah, I am too. I, don't, I was a bit confused by that, but I look forward to finding out. When you said animated and Borley Rectory, my first thought was Scooby-Doo. <laughs> Yeah, no, I get that, but I don't. It's not a cartoon when it's got actors and films. I think it's the background that's animated because, of course, Borley Rectory isn't still standing, so it's not there for them to film. Yes, sadly, damaged by fire in 1939 and demolished in 1944. Exactly. 
And speaking of useless paranormal trivia, are you ready for your next Christmas quiz question? I am, sir. Okay, it's another, lo- all of them are location based. Okay. Which UK woodland has become known as a bit of a paranormal hotspot? Historically, for its werewolf sightings, but more recently due to reports of black eyed children in the area. Oh, oh, I thought I knew the answer with, with, when you asked the question, but when you expanded, uh, now I'm not so sure. Hmm. Is it a trick? <laughs> Did you just give me a clue? <laughs> Okay. It, it might be a trick. It might not be a trick. <laughs> well, I think my questions are probably a little bit easier than your questions going on. on sorry, the I previous thought one, I thought I brought the sort of hardness level down a bit, but I think I might have just been overthinking your question. Mm, definitely. Well, I think I'm going to end up doing the same thing with your question. I think I might already have overthought it, but I shall ponder, and we'll move on to our very festive poltergeists. Now, I did mention it in the intro, but. Can you tell me why poltergeists are particularly (laughs) festive? Well, they're not, are they, (laughs) at all? But the thing is, I was searching for Christmas ghosts online, and to be honest, they are quite few and far between, especially when you've done a few Christmas episodes. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, all I kept getting from Google was poltergeists. (laughs) Yeah, one of mine was from around Christmas time. Yeah, I think it does seem to be. They're not necessarily Christmas ghosts. They don't all happen at Christmas. But I think the reason it kept getting picked up was because a lot of the events mentioned that they happened in December in quite a few of the cases. So I just, every time I looked for sort of Christmas ghosts, December ghosts, I kept getting all these poltergeist cases back, um, which is interesting in itself because obviously, as we've said before, we do personally, we have personally found that activity does seem to peak between sort of October and Christmas time. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that was interesting. But the other thing that was interesting was that I thought I'd heard of quite a lot of poltergeist cases, but the cases that were being thrown up by my searching for Christmas ghosts were ones I had just never heard of. And I thought that was really interesting, and I thought it would be cool to cover some of the lesser-known poltergeist cases, because we've all heard of the Enfield case, and we've all heard of the Black Monk of Pontefract. But some of these were just so fascinating. They had so much to them. They had so many witnesses, and I had never heard of them. So would you like to start us off with our first Christmas poltergeist that you might not have heard of? I will, and our first case takes us to Cardiff, Wales in the 1990s, where the staff of a lawnmower repair shop found themselves with an unexpected occupant. The mower service's business occupied what was once part of a row of terraced houses dating from 1882, although the buildings had been turned into shops in the 1900s. When the mower repair service moved in in the 1980s, they experienced some strange activity from the offset. They would hear stones being thrown at the windows and pelting the roof, but put it down to naughty children messing about, even though whenever they went out to chase them away, they found nobody nearby. But after the property was renovated, things took a bit of a turn, and suddenly things were being thrown inside the building as well as outside. And it wasn't just stones either. Objects started to go missing. Coins, engine parts, keys. All would suddenly reappear in a different place later. Sometimes days later. Now you might think this is simply a case of forgetfulness if it weren't for the fact that when the objects reappeared, they would quite literally fly out of thin air. When one bunch of keys went missing and everybody had all but given up after searching high and low for them, suddenly they heard the unmistakable sound of keys hitting the ground and everyone watched in amazement as the missing bunch came sliding across the floor towards them. Before long, they were experiencing what could only be described as classic haunting and poltergeist activity with unexplained cold spots, terrible smells of burning for which no reason could be found, A machine started up all by itself, and a computer in the office had gobbledygook typed into the word processing program by an unseen hand. At one point, a small fire even broke out in the workshop. This is how it all started, according to the business owner, Mr Matthews, who, by all accounts, seems to have remained magnificently unfazed by events. Where some would have taken off running at this incredible, mysterious activity, 
he and his similarly hardy wife and brother simply decided to name their resident poltergeist Feet. Feet the Bolt. Mr Matthews told a local newspaper that in the beginning things were being thrown all around the shop whilst they watched in disbelief. Although rather than being terrified, he said it was the most fascinating hours of his life, despite the fact that he actually had objects thrown at him. It seemed that the activity tended to stem from one particular corner, and one day, while Mr Matthews was moving things in that area, two large marbles came flying out of the vicinity, narrowly missing the man. Rather pragmatically, Mr Matthews didn't seem to be particularly offended, attributing the rebuttal to the fact that he'd disturbed the spirit's favourite corner. The newspaper article quotes the shop owner as saying, There's no harm in him. We never thought of getting rid of him. He just seems to like playing games with us. They did, however, want to establish once and for all that it was no flesh and blood person playing an elaborate trick. So they set up a test. One night, after business hours, John Matthews, his wife Pat and his brother Fred locked all the doors to Moa's services, confident that there was nobody but the three family members within. Standing around a workbench, they all placed their hands out on the table in full view, fingers touching. Now there was no way that any one of them could throw something without the others seeing. John addressed the spirit out loud. Come on then, throw something. On command, a stone flopped out of nowhere and landed behind them. It was very difficult to remain sceptical at this point. It was clear this wasn't an orchestrated prank. But Fred, John's brother, wanted to see what else the spirit would produce on demand. He challenged Pete. What about a plug? he suggested. A spark plug fell onto the bench in front of them. With a truly scientific presence of mind in the moment, the small group began to suggest that they should record this experiment properly and write down their trials and the results. Pete the Polt was obviously listening and also thought that this would be a good idea, as the next thing they knew, a pen appeared out of nowhere and rolled towards them. As the activity progressed, objects often began to be produced on command. In Pete's favourite spot in the workshop, staff could throw a stone into the corner and it would be thrown back out to them. Amazingly, the poltergeist's favourite trick was to produce money out of thin air. The workers at the shop would joke around and shout out, Give me a penny! And lo and behold, a penny would in fact appear and fall to their feet. They even started finding five and ten pound notes stuck in random places, like in the ceiling tiles or on their cars. Now this may sound like a dream come true, but by this time, the family had begun to grow concerned. They may not have been bothered by the activity, but customers, sales representatives, insurance adjusters, window fitters, even the police who visited after a break-in, all experienced the thrown objects and were sometimes pelted with stones. The family had largely stayed out of the media up until this point, as although they found it interesting, they were worried about customers being put off and consequently losing business. Now, they were growing concerned about the safety of their customers as well, so they decided it was time to get the paranormal experts involved. And so it came to be that David Fontana, former president of the Society of Psychical Research, attended to investigate the claims. The university professor of psychology applied some very practical cautions to his investigations, one of which was to arrive for his visits unannounced. The element of surprise meaning that anyone attempting to hoax a claim would certainly be put on the back foot if they'd been intending to stage any fakery. He also wasn't really expecting to experience much, even if the activity were real, explaining in an interview how rare it is for investigators to manage to be present at just the right moment to actually be able to experience any of the claims, however genuine which is why he was so shocked to witness the poltergeist in action 
the moment he stepped through the door to Moa's services for the very first time. Arriving unannounced as planned, Fontana entered the building to see John and a visiting sales rep, both sitting down, both with their hands on their knees. At that moment, a stone flew across the room and clattered as it bounced off a machine. Unsurprised, John told Professor Fontana that the resident poltergeist was simply greeting him. From that point on, the investigator took the case much more seriously and continued to be impressed by the level of activity. He was even able to experience for himself the act of throwing a stone into Pete's corner, only to have it returned moments later. And apparently this could not have been a case of the stone just rebounding off the wall, because the stone that came back out at you wasn't always the same one you threw in. His report called the poltergeist responsive, and he's quoted as saying it possessed intent and the rudimentary intelligence necessary to accomplish this intent. One particularly interesting observation he made was that although things were thrown around regularly, you never saw the object in mid-flight. Objects would appear and suddenly just be there, but you didn't see their journey to get there. You would hear an object bounce off a wall or machine or clatter to the ground, and when you looked around, there the object would be. But you never saw how they arrived there, which, as far as the professor was concerned, added another layer of the unexplained to the case. Because if someone was faking, you would quite simply see the objects moving. They wouldn't just suddenly appear where they hadn't been only seconds before. Things came to a head when John's brother Fred actually saw the cause of all the activity for the first time. With both men working on a mower, facing each other, Fred glanced up and then froze in disbelief. He whispered to John not to move. What do you mean? John replied. In a low voice, Fred told him, Don't turn around quickly, but gently look behind you. John did as instructed, but exclaimed only, What? There's nothing there. There was a boy, Fred insisted. A little boy. It must have been Pete. In an episode of the TV series Strange But True, Fred described what he'd seen. A young boy in 1940s schoolboy attire, with dark, short trousers, a jacket, cap and big black boots. He had a greyish pallor, but maybe the thing that struck me most was this description. He said, No face, but the face was there. It's hard to explain. After the first sighting, Fred went on to witness Pete on more than one occasion, and it seems like Pete really took a shine to Fred. Eventually, the paranormal occurrences at Moa's services became too much, added to the fact that David Fontana's report was taken quite seriously in the paranormal world, and small business suddenly found themselves with exactly the kind of publicity they'd been trying to avoid. Fearing the loss of business, they moved premises in 1993, but that wasn't the end of it for Fred or his wife. Suddenly, they found things going missing around the family home, oranges especially, pictures tilted in their frames, spoons were thrown up the stairs, pound coins were pelted at the couple. Pete the poltergeist had moved in. However, if it had become too much at work, it was certainly more than the pair could deal with at home. So they sought the advice of a medium who instructed them to break a piece of pottery which seemed to be one of Pete's favourite items to vanish and then reappear. After these instructions were carried out, the activity abruptly halted. Fred was washing up one day when he heard a splash. Putting his hands in the water, he pulled out an orange, and according to Fred, that was the last they saw of Poltergeist Pete. It certainly does seem like a lot of these stories do just end very suddenly. Yeah. Like and there's one last event and that's it, it's done. Yeah, and I think that's quite classic in Poltergeist cases, but there's a lot of other things about this case that really are not 
classic for a poltergeist experience. Um, usually you find that poltergeist cases have a child or a young person involved. Mm. There's often a high level of stress because one of the theories for poltergeist activity is that it is created by a living person and it's sort of the stress affecting them and then they're projecting their emotions outwards and they're causing the activity and you and you find it's usually a child or a young person that it's centred around. But there was no, well, there was a child, but the child was the mm-hmm. ghost. <laughs> and everybody else in the situation was adult. It was a workplace. They weren't under any particular stress. Um, business was good. Things were happy. And there just doesn't seem to be that classic poltergeist mould. And yet the activity with the throwing stones and things moving and even the, the smells and the fire starting, mm. very much, you know, textbook poltergeist. Yeah, I certainly, on a comical note, wouldn't mind if we were finding fivers and tenors all over the place. No. <laughs> would certainly know. not be an issue. That would not go amiss, no. But there was something that really jumped out of me, and it was near the end when he was describing the fact that there was a face, but he couldn't see the mm, face. Or something. I, That's something I've experienced me personally, too. and I find it really strange in that it's almost as if, like, your eyes and the face are opposite poles of a magnet, and you just can't force yourself to look. The harder you try, the more it forces you away. Yeah, I thought you'd probably pick up on that, and certainly it rang true with me. I've seen that as well. One of the apparitions I saw in our very haunted house, I can remember clearly now that I know that what I saw was a young man with like brown, short brown hair, but I have no image of the face whatsoever. I don't know why I know it was a young man. There was, there's no face in my memory. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing an apparition. I can remember what the outline of that apparition looked like. I can remember its movement as it poked its head around the door, but there was no face. And yet I knew what the face looked like somehow without seeing it. And he's right. It is really difficult to explain. And the other thing that reminded me of something we've heard before is the fact that the items, you didn't see them moving. Yes. They appeared at the other end. Mm -hmm. And that was something that Keith Linder told us about with his experiences. Yep. And it's something I've come across a couple of times since as well, that you just... You don't see it in transit, it just kind of appears at the other end. And in fact, it will. this theme will crop up again in my second Poltergeist case, so we'll re- we will revisit this, but you're absolutely right. We, we talked about it with Keith Linder, and that is what struck me as I was sort of researching this story, and I thought there is that is another common theme that keeps cropping up, this idea that things are moving, but there's no time, there's no space, there's no. you're not seeing them in transit, mm. we don't know how they're getting there. They seem to be, and this is why um, it was very frustrating for Keith not being able to capture this stuff on camera. And, you know, it's it's all very easy for us to sit here and go, well, you know, things are moving so regularly. Why can't you record it? But that is one of the reasons that seemed to be what was happening. And I'm sure it's the same in a lot of other poltergeist cases. You're not capturing these things on camera because you you cannot see them move. Mm. (laughs) I think the other thing that came to mind for me was that The business haven't profited from this in any way. As far as I know, you know, nobody that used to work at MOA Services has come forward and published a book about their poltergeist or anything like that. Um, There was very scarce newspaper presence to begin with. They didn't actually want it publicised. As I said, they were more worried that they were going to lose business. So I just, I can't see a motive for them making any of this up. And it was so visible to many, many witnesses that I think it would have been difficult to to keep up the facade, even if it was faked. Yeah, you've got as close as I think you're ever going to get to an expert witness. And in most of these cases, I i don't really see any kind of advantage to publicising or admitting to these things if it's not happening. No, the, generally there doesn't seem to be much to be gained and I, I can't fathom why anybody would try and fake it. So, has that given you enough time to think about the answer to the second quiz question? <laughs> Remind me what the second quiz question was? The second quiz question was, which UK woodland has become known as a bit of a paranormal hotspot? Historically for its werewolf sightings, but more recently due to reports of black-eyed children in the area. Okay, I'm going to go on instinct here, because my first thought was the Screaming Woods in Pluckley. But then I doubted myself. But Screaming Woods in Pluckley. Oh, no. No. Is it Canuck Chase? It's Canuck Chase. Oh, damn it. I thought the black-eyed kids would make that <laughs> yeah, far too easy. Oh, damn. 
I should have overthought for once. <laughs> Who knew? And the werewolves threw me because I didn't knew, know that there was anything to do with werewolves. Like yeah, Chase. that threw me as the well. The Black Eye Kids was the one that made it jump out at me. I thought that was going to be really easy for you. Darn it. Oh, well. You win some, you lose some. I've got a quiz question for you now. Okay. At least I still stand a chance. <laughs> And my next question is going to be told in the style of a classic terrible Christmas cracker joke. All right. So this is one of those. What do you get if you cross? OK. Right. What do you get if you cross actors from Alien, Stranger Things, Ant-Man and Toy Story? Um... No, drawing a blank. Really? I thought you would get this in seconds. Mm, means nothing to me. I... <laughs> oh no, you're going to kick yourself again. Well, mull it I'm over. I'm hopeless at cryptic clues or anything like that, so <laughs> just to warn you now. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I'm confident that you're going to get this yet, but mull it over. And in the meantime, have you got a poltergeist case for me? I do. I was drawn to this story for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first being that the story occurs at Christmas time, but secondly, that I first came across it when researching the Drummer Tedworth story, and it was labelled as the best known or most famous of English poltergeist hauntings, and yet I'd never heard of it. The first thing that springs to mind when you think of poltergeists in Britain is the Enfield haunting, which seems to have stolen the thunder of the Epworth poltergeist somewhat. I think we both decided to avoid the Enfield haunting because it was so well covered, and even more so recently with the release of one of the Conjuring films that loosely covers it. Very loosely. The Epworth poltergeist was to make its presence known in the parsonage at Epworth in December of 1716 and January of 1717. The parsonage was home to the Wesley family and the birthplace of John Wesley, the founder of Methodism and later to become a prominent figure as a religious leader. The activity began mainly as knocks and bangs that could be heard all around the house, from basement to attic, but was soon to increase in frequency and volume. One night, both Mrs. and Reverend Wesley began to hear what sounded like a group of people walking above them, which soon escalated into the sounds of people running up and down the stairs. Out of concern for their children, they got up to check on them. Mrs. Wesley recounts the activity in a letter to their eldest son. Just as we came to the bedroom at the bottom of the broad stairs, having hold of each other, on my side there seemed as if somebody had emptied a bag of money at my feet, and on his, as if all the bottles under the stairs, which were many, had been dashed into a thousand pieces. Now, the bangs, sounds of walking and running, and even the sounds of smashing glass are seemingly fairly common in poltergeist encounters. But for some reason, the report of the sound of money being poured at Mrs. Wesley's feet caught my attention. At first, it seemed an odd detail, not something you might expect someone to make up. Thinking on it further, it occurred to me that the chinking of coin might also be reminiscent of chains. I appreciate that the ghost in chains is a bit of a stereotype, probably originating from one of the earliest recorded ghost stories where the Greek philosopher Athenodorus was visited at night by the spirit of a man in chains who led him to a spot on the grounds and vanished. The next day, Athenodorus dug up the spot he had been led to the night before and found the skeleton of a man that had been buried in chains. After that, he was not to be bothered by the spirit again. So, whilst it is a bit of a stereotype, I found it interesting that a similar sound was heard, and I wonder if there's something about the phenomena that tends to cause a similar sound, even though in this particular instance nothing was actually seen. These events so unnerved Reverend and Mrs. Wesley that the next night they called upon their neighbour Mr. Hall to join them in the house to see if he would also experience the strange goings-on. All three of them sat up late that night, and whilst the activity that night wasn't exactly spectacular, there were sounds like the winding of a jack, a carpenter planing soft wood, 
and various knocking sounds. The Wesleys even attempted to track down or drive out the cause of the noises by getting a dog, but this didn't seem to help, as the dog was just as frightened of the strange occurrences as were the Reverend and his wife. It seems that the most common experiences by far were the knocking sounds, and Reverend Wesley would often be able to elicit an answering knock from the poltergeist when tapping his cane on the floor. He even attempted to speak with it, but was unable to obtain any meaningful response, other than on occasion hearing feeble squeaks, a little louder than the chirping of a bird, but not the noise of rats, which I have often heard. Whilst the piety of the family was to aid in dispelling some of the suspicion that the family were faking the events, it did seem to anger the poltergeist, as it would often disturb the family at prayers, and was particularly agitated at the mention of King George I or the Prince. The Reverend doesn't seem particularly impressed by this, and exclaimed, Thou deaf and dumb devil! The Wesley children, in counterpoint to their parents, quickly became used to the noises and even began calling the poltergeist Old Geoffrey after someone who had previously passed away in the rectory. Instead of being frightened, they seemed to enjoy the excitement of the events. This and the fact that the activity would most often occur in the vicinity of one of the Wesley's daughters, 19-year-old Hetty, would later lead some to suspect that she may be the cause of them. There do not seem to be any cases where she was caught doing so, however, and it may simply be that in many of the cases the activity does seem to be focused on a particular person, and often a young girl. Later accounts of the poltergeist, like many stories retold over time, became somewhat embellished and exaggerated, but contemporary accounts from the Wesleys did include some further escalation of activity, and some quite strange experiences. Door latches would lift by themselves, and the Reverend was pushed by an unseen force on several occasions. Two events, though, stand out as being particularly odd. Mrs. Wesley was to see something under her bed, which she described as like a badger, only without any head that was discernible. And a hired worker was to see something that looked not quite like a white rabbit. All of these events took place over just a couple of months. The family never really reached any resolution, and the activity simply faded away in January of 1717, seemingly without any rhyme or reason. And like so many poltergeist cases, it remains unexplained and an enduring mystery. So, this one was very much more of a classic poltergeist case, like you, never heard of it, so I don't understand how it's meant to be the most famous poltergeist case. Yeah. Not cropped up once on my radar. And yeah, you've got the young girl. Um, I don't know whether it was a stressful situation, because I mean, this is a very long time ago, mm -hmm. but you can imagine it would be. She seems to be the right age and the activity is centering around her, but she was never found to be fabricating any of it. So you had me all the way until you got to like a badger without a head. I know, that really jumped out <laughs> at me as well. What? I know, it just, you've got all the sort of traditional stuff and then you get to the like a badger without a head and you're just like, huh, okay. And then the not entirely quite unlike a white rabbit. Just, <laughs> but, but a bit wrong. Yeah, it reminded me of the line from um, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy when he pulls a drink that's not quite entirely unlike tea. <laughs> it's just like, it's, what is not quite like a rabbit? I don't know. I mean, I was trying to think around it like, uh, I mean, white doesn't, I mean, well, I was going to say you normally see sort of black amorphous blobs, but actually we have both seen white amorphous blobs, haven't we, mm -hmm. at the Cromwell house? But I would not have described that as not quite like a white rabbit. No, no. I just can't. But the badger without a head, I mean... So, yeah. And where was this? Under her bed. Yeah. I'm just trying to envisage. So under a bed, it's dark, shadowy, you've got a small space. Badgers, badgers are actually quite big, though. Mm. They're surprisingly large when you see them in real life. 
I, and without you know, a... <laughs> and she, I know she doesn't really specify a size, but you know. I don't think badges would fit under most. Well, no, I guess they yeah, would. But probably get under a bed. But I remember when I did see one, sort of quite close up. I was surprised at how big they were. Mm. I, oh, I don't know. I just can't. I can't place that description at all. It's very strange. But again, if you were making something up, that is not what you'd no, come out with. No, it's you know, it's certainly not the sort of thing that's like you know that's believable. Yeah. It's like what? <laughs> it what? is completely out of left field, isn't it? Mm, very much so. And that always makes it a bit more believable for me. Mm. You know, when you people are coming out with sort of classic tropes, it, it, it you can be very sceptical about it. But like you say, something as random as this, you think, why would you, you wouldn't make that up? No. Bizarre. Bizarre. Right. Do you have an answer for my quiz question? Do you want it again? Um. Yeah, try me. What do you get if you cross actors from Alien, Stranger Things, Ant-Man, and Toy Story? Now, granted, the Toy Story thing is a bit of a red herring, maybe. Well, it's not red herring, but it might might be a cause for confusion. But well, who's the first actress that comes to mind when you think of Alien? Sigourney Weaver. Yep. Yep. Stranger Things? I don't know any of their names. But you... Okay, just give me a character's name. Um... Eleven. The other one. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm trying to help you. Uh, Why does she keep shouting? She keeps calling for him. All the way through Stranger Things. Mike. 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 Yep. Yep. Who's Ant-Man? Uh, Paul Rudd. Okay. What are those... Forget the Toy Story thing for now. What are those three actors got in common? You showed me the trailer. <gasps> Ghostbusters. The new Ghostbusters film. That's what you get. Ah, I see. <sighs> I got really confused. Toy Story threw me as well. Annie Potts, who played Janine in Ghostbusters, the original Ghostbusters, voiced Bo Peep in Toy Story, which I did not know until I looked this up. Okay. Is Sigourney Weaver in the new Ghostbusters then? Apparently. Oh, cool. According to Interwebs. According to Interwebs, and okay. Finn Wolfhard is Mike in Stranger Things. Finn! Oh, yeah, I did know it was Finn. I can't remember why I remember it was Finn. But yeah. yeah. He's getting gangly now, isn't he? <laughs> Very gangly. But I love that they put him in the new Ghostbusters. I mean, obviously, we've only seen a trailer, but it just looks amazing. I'm so excited. And I literally just wrote this non-question of a question so that I could say how excited I was. <laughs> <laughs> it does look good. I'm, I'm quite keen to see it. Normally... Unless it's Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, I'm not bothered. <laughs> but that actually got me quite excited to watch it. It's got such a feeling of nostalgia. To, they've, they've kind of got that across in the trailer, that feel of the original Ghostbusters. It's got that nostalgic vibe to it. I think it helps that obviously we're both children of the 80s mm -hmm. and Finn Wolfhard brings that sort of slightly 80s vibe along from Stranger Things yep. somehow. Yep. I just, oh, I love it. I can't well, wait. See, when I first saw it, it kind of reminded me of Ghostbusters meets Goonies with the bit in mm, the car. Yes. Because it, it's the kids doing the stuff. And I'm just yep. like, yeah, that, that's got 80s written all over it. Yeah. Ghostbusters meets Goonies. I couldn't really ask for more of a, film, a better <laughs> film than that. So I, oh, I really hope it doesn't like let us down now. <laughs> well, I guess it's up to me to let the side down now with one of my thoroughly unexciting quiz questions that you're probably <laughs> going to find quite easy. It's probably more of a question than my question was. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's another location one. Mm -hmm. This time, said to me the most haunted castle in England. Oh, okay. uh, it began life in the 12th century as a monastery and is believed to be the home of the ghost of a former torturer who apparently still resides in the torture chamber, a lady in white, and a blue boy who said to float above the bed in the pink room. Now, see, the only problem with this question is that there are so many castles in England that are supposed to be the most haunted castle in England. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that doesn't really narrow it down. <laughs> well, you know, I thought about this and I thought, you know, I'm going to go with the, the most haunted house and I'll go with the most haunted castle. I thought I'll make them really easy. I'll be like, they're the most <laughs> But as you well know, as you well know, there are about 80 supposedly most haunted castles slash houses in the UK. Yeah, but they're all kind of a little bit individual. You've got like the most haunted pub and you've got the most haunted castle and you've got like <laughs> the most haunted was a coffee shop, now a pub and used to be a guild hall. <laughs> yeah, you see? Well, I think I actually might know the answer to this one. 
But I think you might. But I'm going to still, you know, I'm going to think about it for a little bit, make sure I'm confident. Yes, yeah, we're one all at the moment, aren't mm. we? I have no idea. <laughs> I literally don't know. I never keep track of where we are in the quiz questions. We'll have to ask the listeners later. Yeah, you did have to help me really, really badly with the second one. So Yeah, I kind of If it's a draw, I think you're in the lead. Well, let's see how I do with this one. But in the meantime, I have another poltergeist case for you. Tell me more. I will. This is the case of the Birmingham poltergeist. And it's another one that breaks away from what we understand to be a classic poltergeist nature as it involves not just one household, but several. It's also another case of stones being thrown by an unseen hand, but they weren't pebbles this time, but big, heavy rocks, which bombarded a row of five houses in Thornton Road, Ward End, Birmingham. At first, the residents assumed local jobs were to blame, but after several days of their houses being pelted by stones and no visible assailant to be found, the police were called in. A couple of police officers were posted in the vicinity and they expected to have the case wrapped up in a couple of days, but it didn't quite turn out like that. The houses continued to be bombarded with stones, which damaged roofs and smashed windows of the properties, with three houses in particular bearing the brunt of the attacks. The residents of these homes spent hundreds of pounds they could scarce afford fixing the broken windows. But no sooner than they were replaced would another barrage of stones rain down and smash them all over again. Police combed the gardens and conducted stakeouts night after night, but they could find no trace of the perpetrators. The residents strung cotton threads around their gardens, ironically using one old-fashioned ghost hunting technique to try and catch the criminals' movement around the properties but the threads were never once broken. In December of 1981, a superintendent of the Birmingham police said that they were treating the case as a very serious crime and had devoted the manpower of major murder hunt proportions and that although the culprit held all the aces at the moment, he would slip up and they would get him in the end. But the superintendent was very wrong indeed. The activity only got worse, and the attacks kept coming. The residents were at their wits' end, unable to sleep or even go about their daily lives. Their health, and not to mention their finances, began to suffer severely. But all they could do was try to barricade their properties, putting chicken wire over the windows, constructing reinforcements out of corrugated sheeting. But it didn't seem to do much to protect against the onslaught. Nightly, police were posted to the neighbourhood from 6pm until the early hours of the morning, some hidden on neighbouring roofs or even in the trees, freezing for hours through the chilly night. But all they could report was that they could hear the sound of the stones hitting the properties, yet couldn't discern any visible clues as to where they came from. A newspaper report quoted the police as saying that over 1,000 man-hours had been spent on the case. But in an interview for an episode of Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World TV series, Chief Inspector Len Turley put it closer to 3,500 man-hours in observations and inquiries in the Thornton Road area. Frustrated, he added that during the time they had been conducting the inquiry at Thornton Road, the Birmingham police had solved five complex murder inquiries. But despite applying the same expertise to the Ward End case, they were no closer to solving the mystery. The chief inspector demonstrated how large the stones were in this interview, as he showed the camera the large, smooth, polished river stones as big as his hand. They were hefty stones. You could see how much damage they had the potential to do. And although there didn't seem to be much mystery as to where the stones had come from, apparently all the gardens in the area had them, the chief inspector noted with interest that all the stones found to have been thrown seemed to have been scrubbed clean. Weirdly, not one of the stones had a speck of dirt on them, or indeed any fingerprints. 
By this time, the residents were beginning to suspect something of a paranormal nature must be going on and called in a vicar, but he merely brushed it off as being the work of vandals. One resident described how the aim and timing of the stones was uncanny, often shooting out of nowhere as soon as she peered out of a window or got up to draw the curtains. She said it felt as though they were being observed the whole time. In a follow-up article from the Birmingham Mail 30 years after the strange events, one former resident remembers how, at the time, she was certain there was a flesh and blood person who must be responsible. But now, she's not so sure. She said, There were police everywhere. They even put a camera in one of our rooms. You could hear the stones rolling down the roof. It was so weird. Nowadays, I believe very much in psychic things. I just wish I knew then what I know now. The police admitted they were baffled and keeping an open mind, but never really accepted the paranormal theory. They claimed that the most likely culprit was someone aiming a giant catapult from a distance far away enough to have been able to avoid the police force that had been crawling over the area for months on end, despite the ballistic experts citing this theory as unlikely, given the accuracy of the bombardment. To this day, though, the case remains unsolved. The police never did get any further with their investigation and certainly never found someone with a grudge wielding a giant catapult. The affected residents had no known enemies and no one could think of any reason that the houses would be targeted, so there seemed no more leads to pursue. In 1982, the police simply gave up, leaving the case open and unsolved. The residents of Thornton Road endured the activity for three years and nobody could quite figure out why it suddenly stopped in the end, leaving the people of Thornton Road with the fear hanging over their heads that it would one day start up once more. Now that is a strange story. I remember we watched something about this a little while ago. We did. And it was very strange. The, the weirdest thing for me is that it's all outdoors. Yes. Like normally Pontecost are centred in a house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, sometimes around a person when they leave the house, but it's normally sort of a combination of a place and a person. And you can understand that as well, because if you're going by the idea that a person is generating the energy, the house is kind of containing it. And that's why you get this kind of storm of things mm. going around. But like you say, this is in an open environment. It's affecting five different houses, although three seem to be the focus. It's coming out of people's gardens and there are hundreds of witnesses that, are, uh, you know, that they, they know it's happening. Mm. They can't, they can hear it, but they can't see anything. And now we're back to what we mentioned earlier. Things are appearing. They're hearing the stones hitting the roof, but they're not seeing them get there. No. And those, the stones that they showed in the video were big. Huge. And fist size. Th yeah, they would make, you know, not a lot of noise, but you'd hear them go past you if they were thrown and they yeah. would take some effort to throw. Well, this is, this is the other thing. I mean, the catapult theory. Now, I have a catapult. I know you can be accurate with a catapult, although the sword I'm talking about is, you know, shooting little pellets out of. Mm -hmm. No, you couldn't fit no. one of these giant rocks in there at all because, like I said, big rocks. And yes, yeah, some people can be deadly accurate with a specific kind of catapult. There are certain sorts that you can't be very accurate with, and that's just how it is. The only catapult I know of that would be big enough to fire one of these rocks, and even then it would be a bit of a stretch, is a tree surgeon's catapult. Now, they are huge. I have had a go with one. They're quite fun. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether the tree surgeon's catapult is the right term. Arborist's cat slingshot, I think possibly they're mm. called. They are basically, you use them to fire ropes up into the trees. So when you're trying to get ropes over a tall branch, mm -hmm. you attach the rope to a weight, you put the weight in a, this big catapult and you fire it up into the trees. They are very difficult to aim, but they are also huge. This isn't something that you could shoot from a house. I mean, the police were saying that they thought this giant catapult was being fired from 200 yards away. Mm, yeah. Now that is what the length of one of our typical the length of one of our typical streets. So if you think about somebody firing at our house from that distance, you'd 
you wouldn't really be able to even see our house without binoculars, not accurately near enough to hit a window. I, I still wouldn't be convinced that something like the catapult you're mentioning would be able to go that far No, I, I don't think it would because, I mean, these catapults are designed to shoot just straight up. They're not designed to aim sort of from across that kind of a distance. Yeah, but something... unless you're climbing a redwood, so you're not going to get anywhere close to needing 200 yards tall. Yeah, I don't know how high they go, but also they're not easy to fire. When I had a go at one, well, I think this is just how they're meant to be used, not just me, but they're eight feet tall. They're on like an eight foot tall pole. And then you have to pull down on the slingshot with, you have to squat into it basically and use your whole body weight mm -hmm. to pull the elastic down before you let it go. And there's just, you could not aim something like that, firstly, at something as accurate as a window because they keep talking about how these three houses specifically and more to the point their windows yeah. rather than the rest of the house or property well, they're and, targeted quite accurately and i remember there was one of the comments was that it happened whenever she looked out the window yes so that would mean not only would he have to be able to aim accurately he would also have to be keeping this thing taut while and holding ready to go. binoculars <laughs> yeah whilst having this incredible aim ready to release the second he saw somebody in the window. No, I'm not I'm not no. falling for that. But also, I mean, they've had police all around this area, you know, scouting the area. So in terms of that 200 yards isn't that far to have been, you know, investigated by mm -hmm. the police in cars, somebody would have seen a dude with an eight-foot pole launching a catapult from it and thought, hmm, that's suspicious because you could, like I say, it's not something you could do in a house. It has, you know, you could only do it outside mm -hmm. in a clear area. I'm Somebody would have seen that, surely. And I mean, I don't, I can't think of any other kind of catapult that would have been close to being able to launch, you know, one of these rocks. No, I just, no. It, like you say, it'd need to be huge. If it wasn't one of those, it would have to be something similar. Mm -hmm. And it would be huge. Yeah, massive. Mm, interesting one. Well, thanks mm -hmm. for bringing that to our attention. I really enjoyed that one. And now you're going to make me answer your quiz question. I am. Remind me, please. Okay, which location, said to be the most haunted castle in England, began life in the 12th century as a monastery? and is believed to be home to the ghost of a former torturer who apparently still resides in the torture chamber, a lady in white, and a blue boy who is said to float above the bed in the pink room. I believe the answer is Chillingham Castle. It is indeed Chillingham Castle. Yes. I chose that one because I know it's somewhere that you really, really <laughs> like and would like to visit. So basically I've won because you tried to give me easy questions and I was horrible and competitive and gave you horrible ones. Is that what you're saying? You said you were going to make them easy this I thought this year. I did, but we're not finished yet. There's still one to go. So at best I can draw. Yeah. I'm not sure you will. <laughs> mean. Honestly, I try I really thought I was making it easier this year. I did, but you know, it just this was interesting, so I'm sorry it went in there. Uh, okay. Right. Now, of course, we're big fans of the tradition of ghost stories at Christmas. And as you probably know, we mostly have author Charles Dickens to thank for that, with his ghost stories going a long way to bringing back the tradition of telling chilling tales around the fireside to while away the long winter nights. But my question to you is, how did Charles Dickens' grave end up empty? I don't know. <laughs> now, to be fair, we have actually seen a little sort of snippet of documentary about this and something we watched. It was quite a long time ago, but I the reason I wrote this question was because I remembered it. So try and think back because you probably do know the answer somewhere deep in your memories. My first instinct is that he was lost at sea or something, so there wasn't a body to bury. Like that's the only thing that sort of common sense comes to mind. No, don't think common sense. Access your memories. So, not common sense. <laughs> um, he dematerialised. <laughs> he was beamed up. Have a little think about it while you tell me our last poltergeist case for today. I shall do my best to have a think about it. Is that where the phrase, what the dickens came from? It's like, where the dickens is the body gone? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. 
Well, I guess I'm not exactly up to speed on my poltergeist knowledge either, as this second poltergeist story is another new one to me, although apparently it does bear the distinction of being the first poltergeist to be shown on television. Popper, the poltergeist, gets his unusual name from his habit of popping the lids from almost any container in the house of the Herman family, who in 1958 lived in Seaford, New York. The ranch-style house was built five years earlier in 1953 and was a stereotypical 1950s house in a quiet neighbourhood. The activity in the Herman's home was to start rather literally with a bang. On the 3rd of February, Lucille Herman was welcoming her children home from school when bottles all around the house suddenly popped their caps, spilled their contents and moved around. This would include shampoo and medicine, bleach, liquid starch, and even a bottle of holy water that had all been sealed with twist-off metal or plastic caps. Startled by the simultaneous explosion of various bottles in the house, Lucille called her husband James, who worked for Air France in New York. But with no injuries to worry about, he didn't feel the need to leave early from work, and instead pondered the situation, and suspected that something like a chemical reaction or change in humidity was to blame. They didn't think much more of it until two days later, when around the same time it happened again, and then again on the next day. At this point James began to suspect that his son was performing some kind of elaborate prank, using some newly learned science knowledge or by planting some kind of carbonated capsules in the bottles. He quietly observed his son Jimmy over that weekend, expecting to catch him in the act of tampering with one of the bottles. But not having done so, he was taken by surprise on the Sunday morning, when the tops began flying off bottles of starch, turpentine, and again the holy water in James and Lucille's bedroom. Thinking that Jimmy had still somehow managed to tamper with the bottles, he burst into the bathroom where Jimmy was brushing his teeth and began to accuse him. As if on cue, however, some bottles in the bathroom began to move, and then one tumbled into the sink and another to the floor before his very eyes. Finding no hidden wires or other means that would allow Jimmy to manipulate the bottles, James took the interesting step of calling the local police department. It took some time for him to convince the police that he was being serious, but due to his standing in the community, along with the seriousness of his demeanour, the police arranged for an officer to attend and investigate. It didn't take long for the sceptical officer to become a believer, as several bottles in the bathroom popped their tops and fired their contents in his direction. The bizarre case was then escalated to Detective Joseph Tozzi. Much like James had originally, Detective Tozzi suspected that it was either some kind of unusual natural phenomena or an elaborate prank, and like James, he initially decided to observe the house and its occupants to get to the bottom of things. The detective soon found himself without an explanation as the popping bottles continued, including in rooms that were empty, and most frequently affected was the bottle of holy water in the master bedroom. James Herman even found that the bottle was strangely warm to the touch after picking up the bottle immediately after it was affected. Later the same day, a figurine in the living room was observed to leap two feet through the air and make a loud crash on the floor. Despite the sound, however, the figurine was undamaged. This was the last straw for James, who, as a devout Catholic, was beginning to think that the church might have more luck in assisting them with their problem. A Father MacLeod attended the house, but as so often seems to be the case in these situations, the sprinkling of holy water and Latin liturgy did nothing if not make things worse. Larger items were now being moved or thrown, including one instance where a bronze statue was thrown across the basement into the legs of Detective Tozzi, who was still diligently recording all the unusual activity. Interestingly, and later to be picked up on by paranormal investigators, Detective Tozzi noted that whilst the majority of the activity occurred in the presence of young Jimmy, he had not been able to discern him having caused any of them, 
and in fact had cleared him of deliberately causing any of the disturbances. With all this activity going on, and with the involvement of the police and the clergy, word had leaked to the press about the activity at the Herman home, and alongside legitimate journalists, the Hermans were being hounded by conspiracy theorists and religious zealots, blaming the Russians, aliens and Satan amongst other things, and they were bombarded with calls and messages. The Hermans were apparently nothing if not polite, and even attempted some of the suggestions, at least some of the more rational ones, sadly to no avail. Desperate, they checked aeroplane flight paths for sonic booms, set up equipment in the basement to measure vibrations in the ground, had measurements taken of water levels under the house and more, but nothing seemed to have any relation to the activity. All the while, the violence of the activity was increasing, and in one memorable event, a TV crew were able to capture the aftermath of a statue being flung 12 feet across a room and smashed against a desk. They were not the only journalists to experience activity either. A photographer for the London Evening News observed his flashbulbs being thrown from a table and into the wall. Needing a break, the Hermans left to spend the night with a relative, and Detective Tozzi remained at the house alone, and interestingly there were no further incidents until the Hermans returned the next day. Still, the activity increased in vigour, with bookcases overturning and now record players being thrown, often in empty rooms. Hopper also now began knocking on walls, which is also odd as this is often one of the first things reported in poltergeist cases, and it seems odd that things should escalate so far in every other regard before it should start here. At this point, Detective Tozzi was stumped, but the case had attracted the interest of some parapsychology researchers from Duke University in Carolina. A pair of the researchers visited the Hermans to investigate and interview the family. They were convinced that none of the family were faking the events, but oddly, during their visit, there was to be no activity for several days. The calm didn't last, however, as a few days later, a table was flipped in Jimmy's room a dish was launched from a kitchen cabinet to smash on the floor, and a bookcase in the cellar was turned upside down. Oddly, the activity was to cease quite suddenly shortly afterwards. On the 10th of March, just over a month from the start of the activity, the parapsychologists heard a pop from the basement and went down to discover a bleach bottle had popped its lid in a fashion reminiscent of the very first event. The Hermans were left without an answer as to what caused the activity, but were glad simply to move on with their lives. This is such a weird one. Now, on the one hand, you have got some classic poltergeist elements to it. You've got little Jimmy, mm -hmm. who I don't think we know how old he is, but he's, you know, he seems to be not, want to say, not quite the focus of the activity, but because there are things going on in empty rooms, I think yeah. you said as well, but the fact that he's there as a young person and there was a mention of the activity dying down while the family were away would sort of lead us in that direction that maybe he was possibly thought, you know, to be the the cause of the activity. Yeah, well, the detective was making notes over all the incidents and he was present or at least in the vicinity for 75% of the activity. Yeah. So, But he wasn't... like The, the detective was happy that he wasn't causing it. Yeah. He was just present but maybe fueling it mm. somehow. So you've got that. But as you mentioned, um, a lot of these poltergeist cases tend to start small with scratching and knocks and raps. And that came sort of like a third of the way through mm. the activity, which is strange. And I mean, to the start of the activity is bizarre enough in itself, just with these bottles popping. Uh, what? I don't... I just can't understand how a, a spirit would cause that because usually it's a case of gas isn't it mm -hmm. it's it's gas building up in a container and the bottle comes off and we've all been there when we've sort of shaken a bottle of fizzy drink and it's gone everywhere and exploded but yeah but it wouldn't force the top off no. it takes a lot of pressure to do that and they tend to deform rather than pop but also some of the receptacles that you were talking about like there was the bottle of holy water well, 
You're not yeah, going to get gas in no, a bottle I, of holy that, water. That seemed to be the most affected item from mm. what they were saying. It was most often the holy water. You can see sort of a chemical imbalance in some of them, like you mentioned a bottle of bleach, but in water, I mean, that's not mm. going to become pressurised magically somehow. No, I know you say some of them, yeah, you know, you could think, that could there was starch and i imagine mm. if you get yeast in that that yep. could ferment and go pop but yeah like water no no very strange i've never heard of another poltergeist case like it no i haven't and you might hear of something knocking over something or smashing it but to make not making it explode pop, no and it like i said like halfway through it was, it was a bit odd that the knocking didn't start until it had escalated so far. But the one thing that jumped out at me seeming a bit odd was that nobody ever appeared to try and communicate with it. Oh, In most other cases, okay. even if it's just, you're driving me crazy, stop it. Mm. Like, it doesn't seem like anybody tried to communicate with it. But this was being investigated by a police detective. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously it's great that he investigated, you know, like the pressure and... The, um, whether there's any vibrations in the room and atmospheric and geographical conditions and I think that's fantastic and I think more paranormal investigators mm -hmm. should measure those things yeah. definitely and record them. However, he's not coming at it from a paranormal investigator point of view. No, it's quite funny when you look through some of the things that I found on this, Like a lot of them all seem to imply that he was just like, he just he wasn't going to say it was paranormal. No. He, he would quite... He got to the point where he's like, I just don't know what this is, but he was never going to attach the label paranormal to it, no matter what. Well, I also got the impression that the family was similarly minded in that respect because, to well, I'm, I must admit, if bottles started popping their tops all around me, I, to be honest, even my first thought wouldn't be paranormal. I would think something chemical. But the fact that he called the police in, you know, when mm -hmm. it sort of escalated a bit more doesn't lead me to believe that he's of the kind the, the father was of the, the mindset that it might be paranormal because it just it seems an odd thing to call the police in for to begin yeah, with yeah and I found that a bit strange at the start because I'm just like I, it's I, an I odd thing to call, do I don't know who I'd call but no. I'm not sure it would be the police I think he obviously got the idea it was supernatural when he called the priest in mm. but but I don't I think it may have taken him a while to mm. to get to that point. It's I not can understand something perhaps going, he was comfortable what on with. What earth is going on? Mm. You know, how, what do I do? How do I deal with? Who do you call? Yeah, exactly. Who are you going to call? <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't get any investigator, a paranormal investigators in, though, did they? Well, they From, had the parapsychologists in. Oh right. They stayed with them and investigated. But to be honest, even they were sort of torn between that sort of paranormal entity as it were and that it might be one of them psychically affecting things yeah like as a telekinetic as opposed to poltergeist yeah but it does seem odd doesn't it because every you know it's it's the first thing you do as a paranormal investigator it's the first thing we see all paranormal mm. investigators do is try to establish that communication and i can see it from a certain point of view with the parapsychologists if they're thinking this poltergeist activity is caused by a living person and is energy being projected out, why would you why would you try and communicate with that? Because the, the living person is mm -hmm. right there. You can literally talk to them. But I suppose it's just so at odds from what we expect of an investigation these days. Yeah, I and mean, to be honest, they did turn up like right at the very end mm. of the stuff going on. I and mean, this lasted like a month. Yeah. And I think they were there for the last few days. So and like I said, there wasn't when they turned up to do the interviews and stay with them, nothing happened for a few days. No. And then it there was a sort of flurry of activity and then the bleach bottle Gone. went pop and that was it. Yeah. Again, following the the theme, the recurring theme that we've seen in all of these poltergeist cases we've talked about today, that you get one last final event and then boom, gone. Yeah, and they're all banished. Generally very temporary. Mm. It, like so many of them it's like a month a couple of months and it just stops yeah very strange well, that was a really interesting one and again I just oh, never heard of it so many poltergeist cases yeah. out there that are just completely unknown to me it's a mm -hmm. whole fascinating new world so thank you for that one but now the final quiz question mm -hmm. do you have an answer the question was how did Charles Dickens grave end up 
Um, it wasn't Charles Dickens' grave. Well, I mean, it was Charles Dickens' grave, but it is a little bit of a cheaty question because only one of Charles Dickens' graves is actually empty because he had two. So was he in the other grave? Yes, he is. So he in, was in his grave then. <laughs> he was in one. So you lied. Of, he was in one of his graves, but his grave, the other grave, is still his grave, and that was empty. Therefore, he was not in his grave, whilst also being in his grave. I should say it was a bit of a cheaty question. It's a very cheaty question. <laughs> no matter what you answered, you could go, "No, actually, that's wrong." Well, no. If you, if you could have given me the information that I am about to regale you with, you would have been correct. He was in his grave. That was precisely (laughs) where he was. Well, it seems that Dickens was against the ostentatious funerals of the time. In his will, made shortly before his death, he gave strict instructions regarding his funeral in an attempt to minimise the pomp and circumstance and requested a simple burial close to home in Rochester in the Castle Moats Cemetery, which sounds quite lovely. But unfortunately, this request was not to be granted. There are varying accounts of why this was, some saying the cemetery was too full, and others that the Dean and Chapter of Rochester requested his burial in nearby Rochester Cathedral instead. Either way, the family agreed that he would be interred at Rochester Cathedral, and a tomb was dug for him in the cathedral's nave. Already having been thwarted in his plans once, The unfortunate writer was to have his plans meddled with again, as whilst Rochester Cathedral was busy preparing his tomb, the Dean of Westminster was hatching his own dastardly plans to bag himself a star burial for Westminster Abbey's Poet's Corner. Westminster hadn't had a literary celebrity buried there since the end of the 18th century, and Dean Arthur Stanley wanted the prestige of adding a big name like Dickens to the Poet's Corner memorials. So by the time his tomb was ready at Rochester, poor Charles had been whisked off to Westminster and never did get his spot in the castle moat, leaving Rochester Cathedral with an empty grave and an unusual story. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Dickens' ghost is said to haunt Rochester's high street, although more unexpectedly, his apparition is also said to be seen at the Omni Parker House Hotel in Boston, America, where the writer lived for a short time and recited and performed a Christmas carol. Despite having a lifelong fascination with the paranormal and being a member of the Ghost Club, Dickens was a sceptic during the height of the spiritualist movement's popularity, and he regularly attended seances in order to try to debunk the claims of the mediums. So we can only imagine that he would have been most frustrated to find out that after his death, several mediums claimed that he'd made an appearance at their seances, communicating with them via knocks and raps, and had even told them the ending to his unfinished last book, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. Still can't believe you conned me into thinking you're going to do easier questions this year. (laughs) I thought I was, I genuinely did. That last one definitely was not an easy question. Well, I only thought that because I knew you'd seen the same documentary I had. I remember. must have been asleep. I don't remember any of that whatsoever. Oh, sorry. It, not ringing any <laughs> bells at all. Are you sure I was there? Yep, absolutely positive. I must have been doing something else. <laughs> Probably sleeping. <laughs> yeah, quite possibly. So you won the quiz. Well done. <laughs> Woohoo, you beat me. Well, I don't... <laughs> You're not making me feel very good about it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll say we're both the winners and to that end, we should award ourselves our annual Christmas cracker. Yes, it wouldn't be Christmas without confusing our non-English listeners by making rustling noises a bang and then giggling. I think what you mean is it wouldn't be Christmas without a dodgy joke and a silly hat. Indeed. (laughs) Here we go. And she won both crackers as well. (laughs) I'm officially the biggest loser. Oh, I'll find a joke for you. I don't know if I deserve a joke. Well, you're getting one anyway. There's yours. Okay. Where does... Uh, it's not even English. <laughs> what? Where do snowman go to dance? I don't know, darling. Where do snowman go to dance? Snowballs. Why was the snowman looking through the carrots? What? <laughs> Why was the snowman looking through the carrots? 
I don't know. He was picking his nose. This literally makes no sense. <laughs> well, carrot nose, that he's selecting a new nose. But, uh, rather than right, picking okay. his nose. Oh, you know it's a good Christmas cracker joke when you can't even understand it. Yeah, Marvellous. Somebody that's obviously not entirely fluent in, in English wrote these. <laughs> I think somebody that's not entirely fluent in jokes wrote these. Well, that's true of almost all Christmas cracker jokes, to be but fair. that's part of the joy. <laughs> yeah, at least they normally, grand... in, normally they make you groan because it's like, oh, that's corny, rather than what? What? <laughs> and, what? <laughs> what a grand tradition this is. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that said, lovely listeners, it is finally time we have come to the end of of our Christmas special. I hope you found it super tinsely and I hope whatever you're celebrating, you have a fantastic holiday and a wonderful new year. Don't forget, you've still got a couple of weeks left to get in your entries to win a Ouija board from the Ouijatorium and a copy of Alan Tigwell's latest book, Collecting Ouija Boards in the UK. All you need to do is get in touch at contact at knock once for yes and let us know the title of Alan's first book on the paranormal. Thank you for all your support this year. We hope you enjoyed listening to the show and that you will join us again next time. Happy Christmas! Happy Christmas! Mm-hmm.